Hey, good afternoon or every good morning, depending on where you're joining us from to everyone. Thank you so much for joining Projects Refocus's uh, community conversation. My name is Brian Jenkins, and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at Howard University working on uh, Project Refocus. And today, as I mentioned, you are in a special treat for our fourth community conversation. arts coping and healing during public health crises. And so we have a great selection of panelists here today who are been working within the arts and healing space who are going to provide us with a great insights and a conversation about the importance of the arts for health uh, during a crisis. But first, uh, before we get into our panelists, I wanna start by giving you a little background on Project Refocus. So, Project Refocus is, uh, which is funded by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and the CDC Foundation. It's a joint led project by UCLA and Howard University. Pictured here, you see our fearless leaders, Dr. Chandra L. Ford, uh, the director of UCLA Center for the Study of Racism, Social Justice, and Health, uh, also a professor at Emory University, and Dr. Monica L. Ponder, who is assistant professor in the Communication, Culture, and Media Studies program at Howard University. So public health uh, crisis communication is often dismissive of the unique circumstances that historically marginalized groups may face, which negatively impacts their health outcomes. The COVID-19 pandemic has provided further evidence that public health practitioners need tools and data for identifying and responding to the needs of marginalized groups during the crisis. Uh, the goal of Project Refocus as a collaborative and community-informed effort is to provide a real-time community-level crisis monitoring system and educational resources for public health practitioners to address these problems. And so racism has been declared as a public health crisis and it both interpersonal and structural racism negatively uh, affects the mental health, mental and physical health of millions of people preventing them from Attending, attaining their highest level of health and consequently affecting the health of our nation. In order to detect the impacts of racism on a given population, practitioners need tools to monitor, detect, and interpret related data. This is essential to the planning, implementation, and evaluation of public health practice. So Project Refocus questions, what happens when the crisis never ends for people? What does that mean for public health crisis communication and how do we do it differently? These are things that we are exploring and answering. And so pictured here, you'll see our conceptual model that pulls together what Project Refocus has determined are critical inputs for optimizing communication about health crises. This model is intended to be pertinent, not just for COVID, but also for other health crises or disasters. To detect these co-occurring crises, for example, racism and a health crisis like COVID-19, uh, monitoring must include data on inequities and disease trends, uh, coupled with input that reflects the community, uh, social media, mass media, as well as input from communities who experience health disparities. These together can help identify solutions to um, an identified health crisis. The point of Project Refocus is to bring in this real-time uh, public health monitoring so that we can have a community-informed response that is reflective of immediate needs. We hope to get a, a, to a point of signaling so that all of these factors together on a local level can inform a local community crisis response. And so uh, in terms of the communication piece, these last two are the ones that are a bit more fluid in that uh, it really takes interpersonal communication, understanding uh, how media frames can impact public health behavior, uh, social stigma, and how people make certain decisions and risk assessments. And so how do we get to the arch from crisis communication? So in the midst of a crisis, it's important for people to be able to effectively communicate, uh, or it's important to be able to effectively communicate to people. People are looking for reliable and trustworthy sources of information, but who is considered trustworthy can vary by community. Uh, the news media does play an essential role in providing information during a crisis, but also so do social connections. 
research shows that marginalized groups, uh, African Americans, for example, often show more trust in social connections in decision making during the crises than their white peers do. So Project Refocus believes that the role of crisis communication should be driven by local people that and that includes artists and art agencies. Art and artists have a way of connecting with people and conveying information in a manner that other professionals simply cannot, and that should not be undervalued. Therefore, we recognize the inherent value of understanding the ways that art can be instituted in um, a public health crisis, both as a way to convey public health communication and messaging, and to provide uh, an outlet for stress and anxiety for the affected populations. And so with that, I wanna go ahead and start introducing our panelists who are going to give us some more um, information about this. Um, so first, we're going to start with Dr. Kia Screen Jeffers, who is an assistant professor at the UCLA School of Nursing and Associate Director for the Arts in the Center for the Study of Racism, Social Justice, and Health in the Fielding School of Public Health at UCLA. Her research aims are to identify and mitigate ways structural racism impacts the cardiometabolic and mental health of Black Americans uh, to develop community partner interventions that leverage our strengths and traditional healing practices and to use innovative approaches for data collection, health interventions, and research dissemination, including theater and media. And so I'm going to pass it off to you, Dr. Jeffers. Thank you so much. Looking forward to hearing more about you talk about the research behind the arts and healing and coping. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. Um, can you all see? Uh, can you see my screen? Okay. Thumbs up, Dr. Jenkins. Yes, ma'am. You see it? Okay, perfect. All right. So um, just to give you a little information about me before I go into my work, um, my background is in entertainment, and I decided to become a nurse because people were dying from preventable mental and physical health conditions due to structural racism and other inequities, and I felt compelled to do something about it. Um, some of the meaningful work that I've done over the last couple of years as co-author with Dr. Ford, um, a chapter in Racism, Science, and Tools for the Public Health Professional um, in response to the heightened awareness of, around police violence at the start of the pandemic. Um, I worked with some nurses to write a statement opposing police violence and unjust policing in healthcare. And then also I've served as a co-chair, chair, and now immediate past chair of the um, public health nursing section of the American Public Health Association's anti-racism pre-conference workshop, um, where this one session um, that I highlighted here dealt with healing as an act of resistance for people who are engaged in anti-racism work. And um, as, as the chair for that particular workshop, I thought it was important that we pause from, you know, all the advocacy and, you know, that we were doing in response to the pandemic to take a moment to heal. But in my work in total, my goal is to merge my art and my science together. Um, um, this, this particular um, image is a snippet from um, an announcement of a grant that I and a community partner and academic partners were awarded by the California Arts Council to use the arts as a means to destigmatize depression among Black women. <clears throat> Some of my other work um, has looked at the impact of the arts um, through opera, through um, other um, forms of community engagement. Um, to decrease mental health stigma, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, unstable housing, resilience, and recover recovery. <clears throat> uh, but um, in particular, my particular interest is in addressing depression among Black women. 
um, you know, although the prevalence rates are around the same between black and white women, it's significantly underdiagnosed among black women and it's often untreated. It impacts daily functioning and we often suffer in silence, which leads to an overall dissatisfaction with life. And so what we did with that grant from the California Arts Council was um, I met with a group of women in South LA with our community partner for four weeks. And we talked about our experiences with depression over this time. And from those transcripts, I developed a play and we produced the play with the actors that you see on the stage. Um, we did five different shows. <clears throat> and after each show, we had talkbacks where the audience members share their impressions of the production, but they also surprisingly really were open about their experiences with depression, their family's experiences with depression. <clears throat> and some of the key themes that came up during those talkbacks were around, you know, really wanting to understand what depression is and what it looks like in their daily lives. They wanted to know, they wanted, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> I'm trying to hold back a cough. Um, they talked about different risks of, um, that went along with disclosing depression, self-medicating, you know, conflicts around taking medications. They talked about their experiences with suicidal ideation and self-harm and the need for seeking help that was meaningful, you know, um, if they were going to engage in um, therapeutic care uh, with a psychologist or psychiatrist, they wanted someone who understood what they their experiences are, you know, their racialized and gendered experiences are. They also talked about self different forms of self management and self care, and just really wanting to be seen and and from seeing the play, recognizing what depression looks like in other women in their families and in their um, social groups. So from these talkbacks, oh, one more. They also talked about um, sister circles. Um, the play was set in the format of a sister circle. <clears throat> and um, throughout each of the productions, after each of the talkbacks, there was at least one person who talked about sister circles, that they loved the visual of this sister circle and how it normalized the experiences of depression. They talked about um, how we need to um, look at how we can use sister circles more and um and that how they enjoyed seeing um how to deal with depression by by viewing this production <clears throat> and so what i did as a next step was develop a intervention that was a virtual sister circle intervention um, that addressed depression and depressive symptoms among black women and so the value of the arts wasn't just that immediate um, experience of, here, let me stop sharing, <clears throat> that immediate, immediate experience of watching the play and being touched in real time, but it provided information on how to develop a intervention that could heal people um, afterwards, you know, and, and uh, heal people who have not seen the production. So, <laughs> excuse me, I look forward to going into more detail, um, you know, through our discussion, but I just wanted to give you a high level view of some of the ways I'm using the arts in my work. Um, and I look forward to engaging with the other artists who are here. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Deppers. I appreciate you. Um, and so we are also looking to engage more too. So uh, next we have Andrea Vocab Sanderson, who is the first Black Poet Laureate of San Antonio from 2020 to 2023 and a San Antonio native. Her dynamic performance style is an originally crafted fusion of spoken word, poetry, hip hop, and soulful rhythm and blues. And she is the recipient of numerous awards and serves as a teaching artist for Gemini Link and is a writer in residence for Hearts Need Art. Her debut poetry collection, She Lives in Music, was published by Flower Song Press in 2020. 
And during the early phases of the pandemic, she partnered with the city of San Antonio to create What Will It Take, a song promoting the CDC guidelines for public health. And she also hosted online readings and other public artworks during her tenure, tenure as San Antonio Poet Laureate. Greetings, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. And shout out to all of the amazing panelists and everybody behind the scenes making all of this go forward with a refocus. So I am here in serving in a couple of capacities. I want to start with talking about, I'll start with present and then I'll, you know, go backwards to the beginning of 2020 and, and take it from there. And I'll try to keep this extremely brief. <laughs> All right, so I work with Hearts Need Art, and I am still relatively new to the company of Hearts Need Art, but to give you a little bit about uh, Hearts Need Art, they are a company whose mission is to create moments of joy, self-expression, and connection for those facing life-altering health challenges through arts engagement, advocacy, and innovation. They were founded by Costanza Rader, who is a cancer survivor, and now our CEO is Richard Wilmore. Um, when I met Richard, he was hosting an awesome like podcast show, and I was a guest on there fast 40 years later. Um, after 20 years of serving at Bear County Juvenile Detention Center uh, here in San Antonio, Texas, I retired. And around December, I, I said a prayer and I told God, I was like, I really want to do something that helps bring healing to people. I want to use my art. Um, to help heal and I was presented with the opportunity to come on board with the uh, hearts need art and also be a part of their podcasting endeavors that they did. Um, the vision of hearts need art is the universal accessibility of arts engagement to help everyone feel seen heard and loved while facing life altering health cha challenges. Uh, the method is hiring and training creative people in community that desire to serve people in healthcare settings uh, with their various art forms and our values are build connection, radiate love and compassion, express gratitude, embody integrity and nurture creativity and innovation. Uh, what we do is personalized care. We work with caregivers, we work with patients, um, over 2000 patients yearly. Uh, and over 4,000 families, friends, and staff. So we don't just work with the patients, we work with the caregivers in nurses, doctors, anyone that wants to participate in the arts through healing. Uh, it's patient-led. So when we knock on doors and we go in rooms, uh, we, we speak directly to the patients. We sit down with them and we ask them, what, what do you want to practice today? What do you want to participate in? We send singer songwriters, painters, visual artists. I, I dabble in the a little bit of the, the painting, but I have come in uh, specifically for literature, uh, being the Poet Laureate of San Antonio. Uh, just finished my tenure as Poet Laureate um, a few days ago, really. So, um, and I've just had the pleasure of being a part of this experience. Uh, going back to the pandemic, you can go to the next slide. I did some initiatives starting in March of 2020. I was told that I would be the next Poet Laureate of San Antonio and, it, and that would take effect on April 1st of 2020. In March of 2020, I started several initiatives. The My Tongue is Challenge, because we were all sitting at home. We couldn't go anywhere. We, could, we were just in isolation, basically. And I was like, how can I engage people to celebrate the literary arts as the new Poet Laureate of San Antonio if we're at home? So I taught myself Canva. Uh, and I started a hashtag challenge, which I talk about on my my TEDx talk. Um, and I asked people to write a very short, short poem about the power of their tongue, because I felt a lot of people felt like uh, like helpless in the situation. And I was like, how, how are we empowered? I was like, we can still use our voice, whether we're at home, whether we're out in public spaces or not, we can still write letters and stuff. I, I partnered with San Antonio Museum of Art and started this initiative called Action Sama, uh, where I asked people to get postcards, create and design them and send those out to people. And when I did, initiatives like the My Tongue is Challenge and um, Action Sama, I saw people just celebrating and participating as far as um, my, the My Tongue is Challenge, over 500 people per 
participated in that and uh, people as far as Australia were uh, participating in that hashtag challenge. It ended up going into a public artwork display that was at, on exhibition at the University of Texas at San Antonio. We had it in a gallery space. Uh, I created a mural in San Antonio uh, during the time where right after the the killing of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and I did several public artworks pieces um I created a song uh to get people to understand the health benefits of following CDC guidelines uh, the song was entitled what will it take and just throughout that year I tried to look for initiatives and things that I could do that would help we can go to the next slide uh I also participated in a documentary um and you can go to you can go forward another slide so this is the hearts need art situation uh the lady with her that is smiling on the left with the glasses on that is costanza uh those and this is just a couple of pictures from working with the patients and caregivers and facilities and seeing the singer songwriters and stuff so even when they couldn't meet in person they were still participating uh virtually in some of these experiences you can go to the next slide. Uh, we'll, we'll skip this for now. But if you're interested in knowing any of this information, you can definitely go to heartsneedart.org and look at some of these uh, benefits and things of that nature. We'll go, we'll go forward another slide. So I created an initiative also called uh, Invite to Write. I have an adult group and I have a child's, a child's group on, a children's group on, on Facebook. And I don't expect kids to get on Facebook. They're definitely not there. But you can go to these um, Facebook groups and join them. And I provide several writing prompts. I'm like upwards of 40 writing prompts that I um, posted on there. Where you can go back and look at those. and participate in the arts uh, through literature. But what I wanted to highlight to you all is I can't express how important the arts are to helping people heal and cope, you know, and we don't necessarily connect institutions to, um, you know, like the hospital, we don't connect it to places like imprisonment, but as someone who sat in a prison for 20 years working, I know that I the same feelings of isolation and confinement go into spaces uh, in hospitals where, you know, you may have somebody coming by once every two hours and there are people sitting right outside your door, but they're not entering your room to engage with you. And, and if you're in those spaces of sitting there in, in, in the hospital, you're you're wanting someone to come and engage with you. You're wanting people that you feel like there's a sense of control when they're entering your space and exiting your space. And in those moments, that control is taken away from you. And so knocking on doors, asking, going room to room, working with Hearts Need Art is such an, an impact empowering thing, I believe, for the people that are sitting inside of hospitals healing. You can go forward in another slide. So uh, this is the last thing I'll highlight. And I uh, one go back one, please. Thank you. Right there. Uh, so I was a part of a documentary. I did the voiceover work for this documentary, uh, documentary that tied the beliefs and the ideals and the thought processes of going through the 2020 pandemic to the migration of the monarch butterfly. And uh, I was so blessed to be a part of this and, and lend my voice to this project. And I really encourage anyone uh, to watch this if you're interested in nature and definitely if you're interested in seeing the ties between these two things, this idea of the spread and uh, of, of uh, disease and seeing the effects that it has and seeing those, those ties. Um, and just many different things. There's always something you can do, whether you are at home, whether you're out in public spaces, whether you feel comfortable or not to leave your house, there are ways and things that you can do to engage in the arts and engage the people that you know. And I just wanna say thank you again for your time. Thank you, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, and so we're gonna go right to our next panelist who is Ashley Witherspoon. And she is a licensed clinical social worker and the founder of Handmade Dreams, a mental health platform dedicated to bringing mental health awareness to everyday spaces. Uh, she served as a mental health expert for 
WRAL-TV, an NBC-affiliated television station providing therapeutic strategies for families to adjust during COVID-19 uh, public health crisis and, continue, excuse me, and contributed to various local and national public platforms, including the national media publication Youth Today and the American Alliance of Museums. The Handmade Dreams platform continues to expand with the Art Wellness Exchange initiative utilizing art to encourage uh, connection and generate conversation around mental health topics. And uh, that's what she'll be talking about a little bit more today, the Art Wellness Exchange. Thank you so much, Ms. Witherspoon. Hi, thank you for the introduction. I really appreciate it. I don't have any slides, but I would love to share a little bit about Handmade Dreams and my background. So I started off as actually a criminal justice uh, major. That was my first toe into uh, mental health, um, working in a detention center. And during that time, during my internship and undergrad, I was told, you know what? I think social work may be the path for you. I was starting groups all over the place. I wanted to know about people's stories and kind of what motivated them, what their hopes and dreams were. And so my journey into social work began. I went to the University of South Carolina. I worked in a lot of community initiatives, headed back to North Carolina, my hometown, worked in the community and the education center, um, then I took a, another route into uh, federal service. So I served um, in healthcare, working with veterans and their families, caregivers, uh, post-traumatic stress, and different therapeutic alternatives um, during that time. So fast forward to 2019, the pandemic hit. And I think like many of us, we were just trying to figure out our next steps, redefine our new normals, and at that time, I had a thought about Handmade Dreams. I wanted to create a mental health platform that kind of extended past walls. You know, mental health can be shrouded to some degree. You know, you go into that one room, you talk about your problems, you leave. Occasionally, you have group therapy. And that was the modalities that we were using uh, in federal service at the time. So I actually viewed a museum. I went to uh, look at different pieces and I had all of these thoughts. And I remember looking around at everyone else and I'm like, I wonder if they're having the same thoughts or, you know, when they're looking at this particular piece or structure, you know, what's running through their minds. And so out of that, the Art Wellness Exchange was born and it really motivates different people, audiences to talk about their own perspectives using art pieces as a launching pad to generate conversation around mental health topics such as self-care, also burnout, empathy, healing. And so I partner with various museums across the US and um, everyone has their own kind of uh, strategy and, and who they're targeting. But we've worked with caregivers in the community. And when I say caregivers, you know, first time moms, uh, spouses that were caring for their partners that may have dementia, um, a lot of different healthcare workers in the community as well that also view themselves as, of course, caregivers. Um, so we've hosted groups in that form and fashion. We've also worked with students at universities. Many of the students coming into the university space uh, post-pandemic, they've lost a few years of just developing emotionally their communication skills, their active listening skills, their ability to empathize with others. And so that's been a need on some of our campuses. And right now we are hosting the Art Wellness Exchange in North Carolina with universities like Duke and NC Central, North Carolina a and uh, UNC Chapel Hill, really inviting students to come and connect and reflect and hear a different perspective, all focusing on mental wellness topics. We've also recently worked here in West Palm Beach, Florida with educators on self-care and burnout. As you can imagine, our educators have been front of the line uh, throughout this pandemic, making sure that our students and our families are still getting what they need and that they're moving on to the next level. But burnout is extremely high 
And so working with educators has definitely been um, a joy. And I would definitely say a learning process for us all. But it's nice to sit in a room and connect and, and share those uh, hopes and dreams for our future. So moving forward, you know, the Art Wellness Exchange, the, our latest initiative, our goal is to really serve as almost a social prescription. You know, in other countries, they use social prescriptions often where you come in, say you have an issue with your lungs. Well, we're not just going to prescribe you medication, but we're going to refer you out in the community to kind of generate some uh, kinsmanship and find your tribe per se. So we may refer you to a choir. That may be one of example of a social prescription. So with the Art Wellness Exchange, museums can also be used as a beacon for their communities. So not only working with caregivers, but working with men, working with, you know, different parts of our population that really need assistance and also responding to crises and grief. So uh, that's an overview of the Handmade Dreams uh, experience and the Art Wellness Exchange. Thank you for having me. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Witherspoon. And so next we have Ms. Avis Gray, uh, who is the leader of health equity with the Ashe Cultural Arts Center in New Orleans, providing leadership to community health workers. Her years of experience working in hospitals leads or led her to uh, engaging health management at the behavioral community level. Um, she has played a critical role in hazard emergency preparedness, including preparing the Superdome uh, for or during Hurricane Katrina, uh, the pandemic flu H1N1, Deepwater Horizon oil spill, uh, hurricane evaluation, shelters, Ebola monitoring, and assisting with the monitoring of medical services at the convention center during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so she will be talking about the I Deserve It so, uh, cultural wellness program, which utilizes cultural bearers and artists as wellness influencers and navigators. Ms. Gray, thank you. I am Avis Gray, and I'm with Ashe Cultural Arts Center. And this is a, pro a project between New Orleans East Hospital and Ashe Cultural Arts Center. It is utilizing culture bearers and artists to provide wellness services. And that's along the continuum. The I deserve it concept is I, which states I as I am as an individual now is good enough. Our populations of people of color have always felt like, um, what is it that I am not good enough? I'm not a person. So the I stands for I am a person and I am good enough. The deserve stands for I'm entitled to. I'm entitled to those things that are in community that I have a right to. And the it is the socioeconomic, physical, mental health services that um, we have a disparity as far as having access to. In New Orleans, we have a 25 year disparity between people of color and our Caucasian citizens in the city. So it is so critical to have a voice that is trusted. A lot of what's gone on past the pandemic has been distrust of government. And that's not new. That's historical distrust of government based on factual uh, incidents that have happened. So now you have a voice that's a trusted voice. That's a voice from the community that is linguistically, culturally, equitably, and respectfully a voice that I trust. And so also utilizing the arts and a creative and innovative messaging will be accepted better by community and understood better. And so in a city like New Orleans, culture is the lifeblood. And so it is critical to use individuals from those communities and the major cultural. I mean, we have hired people that are Mardi Gras Indians, uh, musicians, jazz, uh, brass band. So these individuals can use their artistry to also develop messages. So we're using, um, we're, util we're, we're utilizing them as, as 
ambassadors. So they're wellness ambassadors, wellness navigators. And this is not that we go in and we give what we think the community needs. We develop a partnership with community because we want to empower communities. And we have a wellness manifesto. A wellness manifesto is a declarative statement. It's not asking for a handout. It is demanding that I deserve, I have a right to, and respectfully, I now want to receive it. So we're about outreach, education, connecting to resources along the whole continuum. As I stated before, from socioeconomic, uh, determinants of health, all of those issues that we know have historically um, kept people of color from having healthy outcomes. Um, so we are really in the trenches. We have influencers, that's what we call our uh, culture bearers and artists. We have individuals that are in the zip codes, and then we have individuals that are connected to the hospital system. But utilizing the arts is a critical, a critical tool to impact and make a change in health outcomes in our communities of color. Thank you for this opportunity to pre present our program. Thank you so much, Ms. Gray. And so we're getting ready to, that's the end of our uh, panelists. Unfortunately, uh, Ms. Fuqua was unable to join us today, but I do want to give her um, her bios and give you a little more information about her and the work that she does before we move into our Q&A uh, to close out. And so for any of you, if you have any questions for the panelists, please fill them in the chat and then we can get, uh, get to those. So Ms. Fuqua, a Detroit native, is a certified educator whose career has spanned everything from special education and curriculum development to trauma-informed care through her nonprofit Journey to Healing. She is deeply committed to improving the lives of youth and adults who experience trauma due to grief or loss and dedicated to providing high impact quality mental health services that are free for community residents afflicted with trauma. She empowers her community through intentional programming that promotes healing justice. So I um, implore you all to look up Journey to Healing and, and learn more about the organization and support. And so I will ask for our panelists to come on camera and then we'll get started with the Q&A. Um, and just reminder to all our, everyone tuning in, fill those into the chat. So first question, first of all, thank you all for, for your presentations. Uh, they were phenomenal. It was great to, to learn about just the different ways. And, and what I thought is really important is that you all are engaged, like arts is very broad and you all are engaging in different ways in terms of how and have different examples of how we can better incorporate the arts into uh, public health. And so first thing I'll, I want to sort of talk about is about support. So things that I've been learning as we've been working through Project Refocus and connecting with our community partners is that especially for marginalized artists and people who work in, in this area, there's not a lot of support that seems to come from um, government and other local institutions. And in this case, like hospitals and other left health organizations. So when it comes to supporting this kind of work uh, with arts and healing and coping, what, what sort of support do you think or would you like to see coming from local institutions and organizations? Uh, well, I'll speak in. As a nurse um, in the pandemic and being characterized as a first responder, um, I think artists should, you know, we should reimagine um, or, or expand our definition of what a first responder is in a crisis. Um, um, several people spoke about um, the value of the arts in response to the pandemic, in response to uh, the heightened awareness around racial injustice um, and how valuable the arts has been in reflecting um, our experiences back to one another and, um, and in getting tools, like when you look at the conceptual, conceptual framework that you put up earlier, 
um, in terms of community needs and solutions. Um, I think looking at artists and investing in artists um, as first responders in crises like this to highlight what communities are experiencing and what solutions communities um, have to offer to um, you know, address the problems that are, are occurring in their communities. So in brief, it would be to reimagine you know, the role the artists play in crises and investing in that. I, um, this is Avis Gray. I agree with that as a nurse and um, having done Homeland Security. Um, and I still do Homeland Security and I deploy to do disasters. The concept of reimagining artists, um, they should be at the planning table. They should be part of these initial conversations that we're having with communities to get them prepared for disasters because the voice of artists and culture bearers will be a trusted voice so often our communities are not prepared for the disaster. So there needs to be more upfront conversations from trusted individuals because sometimes local and state and national government adds to the trauma in the preparation and sometimes the trauma after in the way that the information is presented. So we need to look at artists and artistry being at the planning table, being at outreach, being part of that event. When we look at uh, deploying and going in and moving populations for evacuation, that is very traumatizing. If we had artists and culture bearers and people who respect and understood culture that were moving people out of areas during disasters or explaining the importance of moving for disasters, we would have better outcomes and less trauma on the front end on the planning side and on the reentry side. All right, thank y'all so much for that. And I guess to that effect, and, and this has come up in throughout the conversations and, and what you all mentioned now, but what are some recommendations for incorporating Art space initiatives in the crisis response. Um, so there's what is what I've heard, of course, is investing more in artists as uh, first responders. Um, earlier, the concept of social prescri prescribing came up, which um, there is a slight movement getting started here in the in the U.S. for that. But are there any other ideas or concepts that you think would be good for how do you incorporate the arts in responding to a in the middle of a crisis? Something that I saw happen here in San Antonio during this past season, uh, I had an artist residency with the Carver, which is a historical uh, space as far as the during the 60s and the in the in the 50s and and, and then those times the the Chitlin Circuit ran through San Antonio and many artists of color performed at, at the Carver. And something that they were able to initiate in this past season was getting a community vehicle that would go out into community in spaces and set up right in neighborhoods and offer arts and cultural participation to, to community. And I think that it's really cool to see that happen. I know an initiative that I started, it was this, We've had to, during this season, I'm sure everyone here has had to do it, pivot things that you plan to do in, purpose, in person to pivot to doing them via Zoom and having you know resources available and tools available to, to be able to create spaces in your own home where you can set up and you'll be able to offer the arts through a virtual space to other individuals is so important. And then um, just, supporting each other as artists, because I know for me, I was so busy during the pandemic doing performances and shows that I really, uh, it wasn't until uh, Derek Chauvin's uh, verdict was handed down when I was, I was, I, I was, I was crazy. My, my dad was in the hospital and I was sitting in, in the waiting room and I was watching that all that stuff unfold on television and it was then that I actually started to really grieve 
some of the processing of what policing was doing to to us as a people like real time you can't sometimes grieve in that moment because you're so busy being being strong for other people trying to be a voice for other people and you need a support group of people you can come and cry in your cheerios or activate each other or comfort each other and and that is this this conversation is really brilliant think, thinking about how because i was you know and just like some of the other wonderful women in this space we were first responders on multiple levels and i didn't even think about it sometimes like you know i'm working in the prison system but i'm also i'm getting called on every day and some of my other artist friends they're sitting at home they need work but they're not working but because people know me as a leader they're asking me to speak to some of these issues and sometimes i don't want to sometimes i'm mad and i'm like i gotta speak in love i gotta speak in wisdom but i'm hurting and i'm grieving myself and that is it, it was just it got so real yeah i think that's the beauty of the arts when you know when you're experiencing it in real time that what speaks and resonates with people is the honest the honesty you know the truth of what we're experiencing and that's um when i talked about um, for the APHA session, the healing as a resistance, as resistance um, in the breakout rooms. Of course, this was done via Zoom um, in 2021, I believe that one was. Um, uh, in the breakout, one of the breakout rooms was specifically dedicated to focusing on the arts. And so we had a practitioner come in who led an exercise on remembering, on storytelling, on, you know, to really um, let us get the truth of our experiences out, you know, take off the mask of survival, <laughs> what we have to do to survive, but really tap into the truth of what we were feeling and experiencing in real time. So um, when we talk about recommendations, it's bringing in artists who can draw out the real of what we're going through and speaking the truth of what we're going through. I want to add that a lot of times coming from a, I come from a hospital system, I come from a state system, it's difficult sometimes for them to, um, they feel like it's a hypothesis when you talk about arts and wellness. And so our ability to take our quantitative, our qualitative data and show the, um, you know, when you're dealing with academia, when you're dealing with at that level, then you go in and you present this concept. I work with first responders. I do homeland security. So to understand and really get how arts and the impact of artistry and arts and how to start formalizing a relationship with and making them understand the impact and the importance. So we're sitting down more now looking how I can quantify this qualitatively to be able to package it, to present it, to formalize it. This is not a hypothesis. This is real and this is a reality. And so I know, cause I come from an emergency room, Homeland Security, and this has been a transformation for me going into a cultural arts center. And so um, if somebody who has always done very strong kind of the other side of the rainbow and feeling like this was a hypothesis, there is a way that we need to start putting this into a language that is structured and states there is data to support that arts in crises, in wellness, and in all of this can make an impact because what has been going on as far as the existing systems have not made changes in outcomes. And so this is an innovative and dynamic way to move forward. And we just need to start putting qualitative data together so it, it's not just this hypothesis. Well, these are the various variables that support this. I was also going to share, uh, when I have conversations with museums, a lot of their marketing and programming excludes a lot of people in the community. So even when you go on their website, they're looking at K through 12 education, and they may say, we're working with families. But what about our men in the community, right? What about all of these very specific groups that also need to have exposure. So working in the museums, a lot of people don't feel connected. They don't understand the purpose of why they should go or if they went, 
they don't come back. There's no purpose to really come back. They're like, oh, art is great. They can all agree that we need it, but they need to find something tangible to keep them re-engaged over and over again. And I think it's also on our program directors in these museums to kind of get from behind their desk and get a pulse of what's going on in their community so that they can actually plan programming and invite people from the community that's a reflection of what they need. Yes, thank y'all for that. And, and to that note, since the pandemic, have you all seen a greater engagement around this area of arts and coping, both from maybe getting more institutions to actually recognize it's important and, and start um, giving a little more attention there, but also from community members? Like, have you noticed any changes in community members who might be starting to look more towards uh, more traditional or holistic forms of healing? I've been in conversation uh, with the Alliance, and they are an accrediting body for the majority of our art museums, science museums, and historical houses in the U.S., and they put out a trends report every year, and their last trends report, they actually mentioned the importance specifically about mental wellness being incorporated in museums. Sometimes I think it takes, like, you know, the top to really show investment in these initiatives that many grassroots folks in the trenches have been screaming all these years, especially tying it to an accreditation. So if this accrediting body is saying, hey, you want to continue to have your gold star on your website every year? Well, these are some things that we want to happen. And so as a result, you know, the last year or so having these conversations, I've seen them kind of push more to this is what you need to have if you want to be in this particular criteria. So I think it's helpful. One of the things that I've seen since the pandemic, like I said, coming on board doing this um, and connecting the concept of a cultural arts center. So Ashe is a big cultural arts center. That's all about artistry and arts. And um, now we're bringing a whole wellness component in it. We're also collaborating with uh, Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine to develop qualitative data to present to these different entities. We're looking at funding um, from uh, like a state funding that has art written in it, has the data to support wellness. Because now what we need to do is the research, the data that when we look at museums and arts, we're, we're doing things where things that are our culture, like second line dance, uh, poetry, music, what impact that has on wellness and behavior health, how critical that is. And so what we're starting to do now is compiling the data. Uh, we would never have that this organization would have would have gone for a public health grant and got that grant. This is a grant that we worked years before and we just tried to get it based on the need of community. We got it out of COVID funding because our people were dying disproportionately from COVID. We were dying disproportionately before that. But COVID was a wake up call. And then the word of equity with this presidential, with this federal group and everywhere, the word of equity was flowing everywhere. And so how do we take the concept of everybody's using the word equity, but connect the most equitable group is our culture bearers, our artists. These are people who are very soulful, who are very real, who can be, uh, nothing is richer than storytelling and lived experiences. So how do we capture that and um, show them that quantitative data, yeah, that's good, but qualitative storytelling, qualitative lived experience and artistry can make an impact and a difference. So that is the that is what come out of COVID for us to really be able to connect, to get that funding because they really needed that kind of concept. They had to do something different. And to me, this is an opportunity now to strike while the iron is hot because equity is everywhere. And I'm starting to see things that talk about art and medicine, wellness and I mean, arts and disasters. So you're starting to see that language written up. And we need to publish, we need to publish, we need to write about it. So this is an opportunity now 
to really push that, that envelope and to do the publishing and to do the research and to start writing up about what the impact of artistry has on wellness. Right. And so we're getting near our end, but I want to get to this question real quick that came in from the audience. And it's just asking you all, how has the arts helped you personally cope with life challenges? Don't think I could have made it without it. Never could have made it. That's, that's how I feel right now <laughs> without the arts. Uh, it's always been such a foundational pillar in my life that I always call back to. And it always calls back to me and it's always gonna find you as an individual if it's your calling in life. Mm -hmm. Someone's gonna ask you to do something, to create something. And we just have to remain open to it. We have to really know how necessary it is to get in quiet spaces and do our reflection and ask our our source um for me for, for me as god you know to to call call out and, and say god i really need something to say to walk in love to walk in patience to walk in the virtues of my understanding as much as i can when it comes to that and trust that when we when we open our mouth to speak and when we when we start creating in whatever form your your discipline looks like as far as art is concerned to really trust yourself and to know that your human experience is not you're not an island unto yourself and that we, we can open up this this uh for other people to let them into our space and allow the vulnerability of our experiences to connect us to other individuals um i was recently in new orleans uh, got to perform at Ed Xavier, and I look forward to going back um, and and create, you know connecting with Ashe uh, with Arts to Action. But it's like when you can get in other spaces with other people, it's 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 mind blowing. How no matter where you go, you're gonna talk to somebody who's gonna echo some of the same sentiments that you've gone through, and you're like, wow, like really. Um, we're not that different as individuals and we definitely need each other. We need we need our tribes, whatever our tribe may be. And I'm sure some of y'all have sat in Zooms over the past three years and unpacked a lot of stuff with other individuals. And it's just about remaining open to that experience. Always be open, always be willing to share your heart when you think, oh, maybe I shouldn't share that. No, you should. Uh, for for me as well, um, it's what got me through my childhood, the hard times of uh, growing up, um, all the way through today, you know, from drawing out things to writing a poem to, um, you know, during the pandemic, we used, um, we did a virtual presentation of the play for a group of women and just, you know, for us to use that as a um an opportunity to talk about what we were experiencing. You know, the play brought out the discussion. Um, so uh, there have been times in presentations when I was thought it was a little tricky to talk about structural racism, but presenting it in the form of a poem first disarmed people and opened them up to hear it, hear what it was and what it looked like and what people's experiences are, you know. So I continue. I cannot survive without, I see myself as an artist before I see myself as anything, a, any other role I fulfill, a nurse, researcher, faculty member, you know, I'm an artist first. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a source of survival for me and thriving. During the pandemic, we had, we were going our family. So we had uh, three babies under three, three and under, yes. And so uh, during that time, you know, the Art Wellness Exchange, I definitely could relate and empathize with all of the perspectives, whether it was from caregiving or empathizing or the violence that was happening in our communities and looking at my little babies, like, you know, what next as a parent, how do I protect them, but arm them with information. And the arts has really been a blessing to our family. Our kids go to the art museums, they engage. They have a pocket policy, of course, because 
I can't allow them to touch anything, but they share their own perspectives and what different pieces mean to them. And it's really been a joy to watch them through this process. So thank you for asking the question. It has been transformational for me because as a nurse first responder working in urban ERs and from all the way from Katrina to the pandemic, I have been working as a like first line um, first responder. Working with the arts has been extremely transformational for me. And I think it's important to also utilize that with healthcare providers. We're doing stuff called an equity toolkit. We're working with healthcare providers to really the realness, the openness, the ability to really take a minute and utilize spoken word, to utilize the arts, the, the mental health component of that, the realness of the culture bearers and artists have done, um, it has been uh, absolutely transformational. And I am excited to really take this concept because I've worked in this arena for decades and utilizing artists, utilizing um, the artistry as a way to get messages out, as a way to uh, decrease the anxiety and the trauma and the disparity is critical. It is not a hypothesis, it is a reality. So for me now, um, I'm very type A. And so it has allowed me to take those minutes and go into myself to sit down with some of the most fabulous individuals who know how to deal and navigate through artistry. And um, it's wonderful. You know, being in this city that's culture, I've always looked at it as one way, but now I know that it is the answer to so much of the problems, even the violence that we have going on in our city. It is the answer. It is the navigator. Uh, it is the connector. And it is going to be critical as we move forward. And it has done that for my life that has taken off some of that stress and allowed me to go into myself and be able to do this work by being connected to such dynamic, because this is hard work, but being connected to artists really allows you to do this work. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank y'all so much. So uh, we are at time. So I want to give a, a, a big thank you to all of our panelists. Once again, thank you for coming through and just enriching us today um, in this conversation. And I just want to say that, uh, do a few acknowledgements. Please reach out to uh, Project Refocus at howard.edu or visit our website, projectrefocus.com uh, for any collaboration opportunities. Um, and want to acknowledge all our partners at Howard University, UCLA, the CDC, CDC Foundation, um, as well as our, our technical support um, and our project partners with SRB Communications. And thank you to all our community partners in Albany, Georgia, Wake County, North Carolina, uh, New, the Bronx, New York City, Detroit, Michigan, San Antonio, Texas, and Lincoln, Arkansas. And then finally, I want to direct you to our, uh, so as I mentioned, this is our fourth community conversation. So we have our previous three, which are on our YouTube, Project Refocus on YouTube. So please go there and check out the rest of our conversations. And this one once it's uh, uploaded. So thank you so much. Y'all have a good day. <laughs>